Good, e good evening. Thank you everyone for coming in person. We've got a crowd tonight. Thank you for coming on Zoom. We're just going to start with announcements. Then we're going to head right into the speaker so that our speaker, who is uh, also going to Sacramento tomorrow, can get, uh, can get there before the wee hours. Um, so just a few quick, super quick announcements. Uh, uh, and then we'll go to show and tell. And then we'll do the opportunity table. Opportunity table is fantastic. Uh, species and complex uh, paths. So really a fantastic opportunity to table by a lot because these are not cheap pl uh, plants and the, 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 the speaker has been gracious enough to offer these and also plants for sale in the back from our speaker tonight. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, as always, uh, judging tonight, if you have plants, we're, the judges are in the back room right now. You can still have your plants. Uh, uh, and uh, we will also, uh, tomorrow is in Sacramento. And finally is in third Saturday. Third Saturday. So that is 18. Next slide. Um, again, uh, our combo. Board and show committee will be uh, Monday. All are, all are welcome. All members are welcome to attend if they want. Uh, the board will be meeting there. Uh, again, no in-person meeting in July, but we will be having... Um, Andrea Neeson. Andrea Neeson. Thank you. My brain farted for a moment. And Andrea Neeson from... Um, from Colombia, she'll be doing it via Zoom. She'll be talking about the cloud forest orchids native to Colombia. Um, so it'll be a very interesting talk and on a lot of species that we don't often hear about, but these are orchids that can grow up for, uh, if you can ever find them and then you can often get them from some of the vendors that come to Pee Wee. They will grow very nicely in our cloud forest condition in the city. Um, and the forest orchids in the park is, is at the end of next month. Tickets on sale now. Tell your friends, tell all, buy your tickets. Um, and uh, last bit, um, uh, new orchids and bark. If anyone needs bark, we're putting in a bark order for the society. It will be shipped by the end of the month. So uh, come to me by the end of the meeting to put your order for bark in. We've still got space on the third pallet if anyone needs bark, moss, fern, anything else. Uh, contact, come to me. And now we'll go to, now I'll just introduce our, am I going too fast? Okay. Um, I announcement for the new members, please. Oh, new members, yes. New members. New members. Thank you. New members, uh, yes, uh, John Oldfield, Joe, Muslims, Kevin Chu, thank you very much for new members. If you're here tonight, thank you. And feel free to jump there. New member, new member. New member, feel free to say hi. And thank you. Margie, this is your first meeting, right? This is your first meeting. Welcome, welcome. And so, okay, tonight's speaker is Teresa Hill. Uh, she'll be speaking to, tonight about complex pathiopetalums and the new breeding. Uh, Teresa has been a partner of Hill Hill Orchids in, um, in, in Oregon and will be and has been breeding pathiopetalums of uh, Miltoniopsis and Mastivalius for 32 years and has, and has been doing some of the most fantastic work in. You don't want to shoot a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, just, we're over 32 years. <laughs> plus <laughs> minus something. Plus <laughs> minus something. Um, and has got over 150 American Orchid Society awards, including <laughs> S. <laughs> <laughs> 200. 200. 200. Mine says 150. You need well, well, over 200. See, someone's prolific. Someone for okay, um, including FCC's gold certificate and show trophies and AQs. Um, and so uh, we thank her for speaking to us tonight. Teresa, the floor is yours. Well, it's been 10 years. <laughs> Thank 
Can you hear me? Yeah. I think I have a booming voice. I think you can all hear me, can't you? Without it's speaking it's into the creature there. Oh, I'm sorry. Can they can they hear me if I can you all hear me? If you could get a little closer to the mic, that would help. Okay, how about this? Uh, I really don't want to stand in front of anybody here, but um, anyway. Um, actually, Hillsview Garden started in 1974 when I was still in college and I got my nursery license uh, at that time because I was breeding Japanese iris, Hanashobu. Um, and as time went on, I also grew orchids uh, indoors under lights. And my husband said, why don't you turn your hobby into a business? And so I blame him for, <laughs> for all of this. But right, right. And my husband retired and now he works for the nursery. So um, it all has come together. Um, uh, when we first started growing orchids, we used to grow Mastivalias and Draculas and Odonoglossums and just about a little bit of everything. And as time went on, we kind of narrowed it down. We sold um, the Mastivalia collection. And in the last, oh, seven years, about seven years ago, we sold our Miltoniopsis collection mm -hmm. to a grower in Hawaii. Um, and we're very pleased about that because they're continuing to breed it to uh, breed some of our stud plants. Um, so at any rate, now we are um, just doing uh, Paphiopetalums. Uh, next slide. Um, tonight I'm going to speak on Parvocephalums, both species and hybrids. Um, and one thing in common with all of the Parvocephalums are these inflated commode-like pouches that you see here that have been removed because we take the pouches off and the ventral sepal so we can pollinate uh, on the stigmatic surface. So it's a lot easier to remove the pouch and the ventral sepal. That way we can easily um, uh, do our pollination without damaging the plant. And we find by removing those uh, two uh, pieces uh, from the flower carefully, um, everything goes just fine. Um, next slide. Um, one of the points that I want to make about this talk, um, while these are not parvocephalums, um, this slide makes a point for me. On the right hand side are two Charles Worthy eyes. The lower one, Charles Worthy eye Eureka, was awarded in uh, 1976. Uh, the one above it was awarded in 1975, um, which tells me that these two plants were jungle collected plants. And they were grown for several years. Obviously, you can see the size of the plants. They probably were grown for four or five years um, to get them to this specimen size to be presented for judging. Um, the flower on the left, uh, Charles Worthy I Malpa Star, uh, FCC AOS 90 points, is a nine centimeter by nine centimeter flower. Mm -hmm. And the point I want to make is that the flower on the left hand side with the FCC is the product of multiple generations of crossing, back crossing, out crossing to attain this perfection or what we perceive as perfection. Um, and the point I want to make is if you get a jungle collected plant, um, it is better to buy uh, plant species in particular from nurseries because all of the great um, uh, quality flowers are already here in the United States and in other nurseries around the world. Um, I know in the case of recently Hangianum, which is a relatively new species, the Taiwanese are already three and four generations down the road as far as, far as quality is concerned for Paph Hangianum. The same thing with uh, Ferianum, we're on our third and fourth generation um, of breeding Paph Ferianum. So there's really no need to buy jungle collected plants. Um, next slide. Um, one of the first of the parvocephalums to be introduced into cultivation is Paph del Nadii. Um, Paph del Nadii was first um, uh, discovered in 1913 by a French army officer. 
Um, it was rediscovered in 1922 um, and plants were exhibited in Paris and Guillamin was able to make the description from those plants that were exhibited in Paris in 1924. And here are two um, really nice examples of the standard form of Path del Nadia. Next slide. Um, and this is the geographical distribution of um, Path uh, del Nadia in Vietnam. Next slide. This is Path del Nadiai forma albinum as described by Bream, Guido Bream in 1998. This is Margaret HCC AOS. We're on our third generation of Alba um, del Nadiai Albas. Next generation, next slide, please. <laughs> I had three hours of sleep last night. So um, this is a really fine Path del Nadiai forma vinicolor as described by Olaf Gruss and Root in 2007. This is Passion, one that we selected from a group. We had purchased some compots. At any rate, this was probably one of the nicest ones. And we have already sibbed them and made primary hybrids using this particular color form of Del Nadi I form of Vinicolor. Del Nadi I form of Vinicolor in early 2000 was found in an open market uh, in Vietnam. And the plants um, exhibited some strange and unusual characteristics. Next slide. Um, as you see in the, this is Path del Nadii vinicolor in the, the central leaf here. Do you see the black line going all the way around the leaf? That is typical of Path del Nadii form of vinicolor. Um, the del Nadii on the top is a standard colored form of Del Nadii. And the leaves on the lower are Del Nadii Alba. Next slide. Looking at some Del Nadii hybrids, next slide. Uh, this is Path Armini White, um, a primary hybrid of Armini Occam and Del Nadii. On the left is Del Nadii Full Moon AMAOS. And on the right is the Cultivar Champagne. Um, the Del Nadii on the left was made with a standard uh, form of Del Nadii, whereas the flower on the right was made with Del Nadii alba. And while Del Nadii standard form has the characteristic of bleeding out the color in its progeny, um, the Del Nadii alba allows the yellow coloration from the Armeniacum to come through in a good number of the seedlings that we flowered. Next slide. This is Path Joyce Hasegawa, a cross of Del Nadii and Emersonii. On the left is Snow White and on the right is Pink Wings. Um, next slide. This is Path Incharm Handel, Del Nadii by Hangianum. I noticed that there's a Hangianum up here um, on the table, I believe. Um, one of the nice things about Hangianum is it imparts great size to its progeny. Um, also heavy substance. Uh, on the left is a uh, Chang Bronze Metal Taiwan Orchid Growers Association, and on the right is uh, Bear 8 from Hongsheng Orchids in Taiwan. Next slide. This is the sort of thing that you get when you cross Del Nadia with a complex uh, path. This is Path Root and Tutin, um, cross of Winston Churchill with Del Nadia. And in this particular case, Del Nadia does not wash out all the color. And that's typical when you cross complex paths with Del Nadia, which is different. Um, this is Pink Jamboree AM AOS 80 points. Next slide. And this is Del Nadia with Rothschildianum. This is Del Rossi, Lahua Wings, HCC AOS 78 points with really nice color. Uh, the wonderful thing about using Del Nadia with any species is it increases the size of the flower um, exponentially. And you certainly see that in, with such crosses as everybody has seen and awed over the Path Del Goldies, um, Del Nadia, excuse me, Rothschildianum and Armeniacum. Next slide. Uh, looking at Path Macranthum, uh, Tang and Wang 1951. 
Path Macrantham is from Northern Vietnam and Western China at about 1100 to 5200 feet in elevation. Um, you'll hear over and over again, um, as I described many of the species, all of the species certainly, that they are high elevation plants that are typically dry uh, in the fall and winter with heavy fog. And then the heavy rains come in late spring and summer. Um, and this particular plant at 5,200 feet gets quite cool. We grow our macranthums and armeniacums in the back of the greenhouse and the temperatures get down as cold as the upper 40s. You could very easily grow a good number macranthum and armeniacum in particular with things like masdevallias because they are truly cool growers, high alpine plants. Um, also, the thing about uh, all of the Pathopetalum species are endemic to what is known as the South China Vietnam subtropical evergreen forest. Um, next slide. And this is the geographical distribution of Path Macranthum. Next slide. I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to try to move through quickly. I think I have 90, so if you need to get the hook, just let me know. Um, this is Path Macranthum variety Eberneum. Um, to me, it's a horticultural variety because it's not been described taxonomically as a true forma. Um, this is Macranthum variety Eberneum. This is why FCC AOS 90 points. According to Guido Breen, uh, you cannot separate, separate out a distinct form of a species just by color. There is an exception, and those are albas. Next slide. This is Macranthum forma alba flavum, and this is the alba form of Macranthum. On the left is Memoria Hitoshi Yokosi, FCC AOS 92 points, exhibiting more of a xanthic coloration than an alba. Oh, that's good. And the next slide. Am I going to do finger puppets? <laughs> Should have brought some water. Oh. There is no water. I'll, I'll grab a. I don't have a oh, That'd be fine. You know, I can take the sugar. <laughs> okay. uh, yes, um, again, on the right is Pickerby FCC AOM. Sorry. Um, uh, exhibiting more of what you would expect from a true alba. Uh, next slide. Looking at some of the macranthum uh, hybrids, next slide. Uh, one of my favorites, Magic Lantern. Magic Lantern is Delmatii and Micranthum. On the left is Parkside AMAOS 81 points, and on the right is Chaucer's. Next slide. This is a particularly fine colored form of Magic Lantern. This is variety Columbo, AMAOS, uh, 81 points. Really intense coloration on this. I hope the color is correct. Next slide. Uh, this is Path Fanaticum. I really love Path Fanaticum because the flowers are so large and stately. Uh, Fanaticum is Macranthum and Malapuensi. Malapuensi, of course, has a huge tall uh, stem and it imparts that to this hybrid. So you get these wonderful, strong, erect self, uh, um, erect stems. Um, on that left, might even come up if he isn't showing on Zoom. We're, we're still back at Colombo. Okay, sorry, we'll wait. Um, while that is being fixed, um, uh, one of the things I can say about culture is we tend to grow, and you'll see at the end of the, of the slide program, we grow most of our uh, parvicephalums in either bulb pans, shallow bulb pans, or colanders. The plastic colanders that are used for uh, cleaning vegetables, we typically go to the Vietnamese or Asian stores and buy 
all of the small and medium sized colanders um, and grow them that way because so many, so many of them are stoloniferous in habit, which means they send stolons or what you would expect from say iris, but much more extended. Um, so typically if you put them in a four inch pot, eventually the growths or the stolons will come out the bottom. And when that happens and you have a new growth coming out the bottom of a cracked pot or where the drainage hole is, we'll take that and set it in a colander, put bark around it and let that new growth root and maybe get one or two more growths on it before we cut it. And then you have two plants very simply and easily done without um, causing havoc to the rest of the plant. Um, are we fixed now? Are we all set? I think so. Everybody good online? Okay, great. Um, this is Fanaticum uh, purple web. It has much darker color. And on the left, you can see one of these red colanders that we grow um, many of our parvicet ones in. Uh, and let them turn into these large specimen plants with multiple spikes. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, for Char. This is Charlene Zegri. Um, that's okay. This is Charlene Zegri, a cross of Micranthum and Fanaticum. That's taking the previous uh, photo of Fanaticum and cross back crossing it onto Micranthum. And this is the results you get, the intensification of color. Um, this is Fanatic Vision, AMA OS 83 points. Next slide. And this is Kevin Porter, a cross of the Latchlum and Macranthum. And this is the sort of thing that you get when you cross the Brachopetalums with the Parvocephalums. You get this wonderful saturation of color uh, as exhibited in these two Kevin Porters. Next slide is another example of taking a Brachopetalum wenchenense and crossing it with a Parvocephalum uh, micranthum. This is Akigoromo. Um, this is bear one from Hangsheng orchids in Taiwan. Next slide. This is Glory Novel. This is taking micranthum and crossing it with, with, with Ross Julianum. And you get these wonderful, again, saturation of color. This is TriStar FCC AOS, 90 points. This is a particularly good one. Uh, next slide, I think Armeniacum. This is probably my favorite of the Parvies. Mm. I think that probably has something to do with the fact that um, I remember when they first came in and um, growing them and flowering them and just really being awed by the color. Um, this is, uh, Armeniacum is, um, a very cold grower. It's very high elevation. Uh, Armeniacum is right about 5,200 feet in elevation. Um, we let it get down into the upper 40s. Um, I remember when we first grew it, um, we had a visitor from Taiwan, Penchi Lai, came to the greenhouse. And because I was growing it in with the Miltonias, I didn't have any idea how to grow the plant. And he said, you need to put it in with your master values. And sure enough, we did. And that fall spikes came and success. Um, just a matter of knowing what to give the plant. Um, this is Prince, I can't even pronounce it. Next slide. <laughs> uh, and this is the restricted geographical distribution uh, of uh, Path Armeniacum. It just comes from a 200 square mile um, area above the Salween River, according to um, um, Guido Bream, excuse me. Next slide. This is the alba form of Armeniacum. This is Armeniacum forma marchii, uh, as described by Olaf Gruss in 1997. Next slide. Looking at some of the Armeniacum hybrids. Next slide. This is Narito Hasegawa, um, who we lost this last year. And I'm sure all of you knew Nerito, and many of you did. Um, he was a very special um, to me and to many path growers. We learned so much from Nerito, and his kindness and gentle way will truly be missed. Um, it's one of the people that we lost over the last several years that really um, was hard to take. Um, 
It's a cross of Armeniakum and Malapuensi. This is Kentaro, uh, silver medal, Japan Orchid Growers Association, 82 points. Next slide. That's okay. That's okay. I'll keep talking about growing. Um, we fertilize. All of our plants are fed with a 15-5-15 CalMag fertilizer. Um, and we tend to uh, grow all of our uh, parvicepalums with the exception of Emersonia is grown much brighter. Um, it likes to grow in much brighter light than the other parvies, um, which is not surprising when you look at the foliage of Emersonia, it has solid green leaves like the complex. Whereas so many of the other parvicepalums have the mottled foliage uh, like, you know, Colosum and so many of the Maudii types, which if you look at the species of many of those um, a plant, so we tend to hydrate that plant. We've lost Zoom. Much, yeah. much more yeah. often. We're working on it, um, but I'll continue talking about culture. In the meantime, does anybody online have any questions so far? A question. Yes. You're talking about uh, Emersonii because the leaves needs higher light. How can you uh, the yeah, the question is um, uh, about uh, path emersonii needing higher light. The question is, what about path hangianum? Uh, path hangianum, we grow very bright. Um, in fact, my hangianums are with the multiflorals. Um, when I initially uh, brought them in uh, from Hawaii, um, Hilo Orchid Farm, um, I grew them along with the other parvies uh, that were more shaded. Um, and when I repotted them, I moved them over with the multiflorals because a friend said they really need more light. Um, and as soon as I did that, they just really perked up more. And, um, and I'll show you a photo of one that flowered uh, recently, just a month ago that was awarded um, and they look much happier and, and are coming along a little quicker. Hanging on them is a very slow grower. If you buy small seedlings, they will take forever to get up to size. Flasks, forget it. They are really slow. Um, so with so many nurseries selling larger plants, you're almost better to opt to get a larger plant and even pay a little bit more money for it because it's more established and um, isn't going to give you as much trouble as a smaller seedling. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a group of Narito Hasegawa that flowered in the greenhouse this, uh, I would say March. Um, and these are two different crosses. Next slide. This is Pafumi's Delight, Armeniakum, and Micranthum. Uh, Eileen is on the left. Sunset Valley FCC AOS is on the right. Um, next slide, we've taken Fumi's Delight and crossed it with Malapuensi to a remake of Pathema Decker. What I love about this hybrid is if you notice the petals, that reticulated pattern that you see, that webbing that you see in the petals is much more intense and covers the surface of the petals much more than say Malapuensi itself, which is where a lot of that netting comes from. Yes. Is that um, you know, several people have asked me about that and yes, but not as a pronounced. The question was, does this hybrid have the fragrance of Malapuensi? And my answer is slightly, but not as intense. Next slide. This is Path Barbara Larkin, Fumi's Delight again, crossed with Armeniakum. And some of them had much more orange coloration in the petals. Um, next slide. This is TB Warren. Fanaticum and Armeniacum. This is a seedling under number. Next slide. This is Golden Palace. You see, I love Armeniacum. I've made all kinds of crosses with it. Um, this is Memoria Larry Hoyer um, crossed with Armeniacum. On the left is a seedling under, under number and on the right is an awarded Midas Touch. Next slide. And this is Franz Glanz, Armeniacum and Emersonii. On the left is Monster FCC AOS, and on the right, Chunky AMAOS. I believe both of these are from Ramon, Ramon de los Santos. I believe these are his plants. Next slide. This is Path Helen's gold. Uh, the color isn't, the color is just intense yellow. 
um, it's a taking a complex Annette Golden Age and crossing it with Armini Occam. We made the cross and uh, the pod in the lab produced seven seedlings. Every single plant that flowered was better than the previous one. So they've been fantastic. This one just got uh, an FCC. Uh, we also have one that got an AM and I sold one uh, plant for um, an arm and a leg. Um, and the other ones we're keeping because we're trying to do a second filial generation that's taking two seedlings and doing a sib cross and thereby hopefully able to produce many more seedlings. Uh, unfortunately, our last two tries have been fruitless, so, but we'll keep trying. Uh, Annette itself is not a prolific um, breeder. Yes. What is the fertility of breeding the heart stuff along in the like, uh, into the complex and the the small pectorals? Is the is the is the fertility going down? For example, like you from Kinturkill a while back, do you still get the fertility that you get from the Kinturkill dominant? Um, yes, I don't see that the fertility um, in certain hybrids. Yes, that's true, but across the board, I don't. And I'll show you some examples of complex with parvies very shortly. Next slide. This is Dahl Goldie, a cross of Rostolianum and Arminiacum. This is gold metal girls. We remade um, Dahl Goldie and I would say about uh, 10 of them received FCCs. Not us, but other customers. Uh, many of our customers received awards on them as well as AM. Next slide. We finally got our own FCC on the sherry, <laughs> the lower right. I practically sold out all the plants before I got an award. Um, and Woodstock also got an AM above, but they were very high quality, really good um, quality uh, flowers. We used a, a Roth Julianum from Terry Roots breeding line <coughs> and one of our good Arminiacums. Next slide. These are some of the Malapuensi we are using for breeding. These are three different plants that, and you can see the shallow bulb pans here. They're only about that deep. So um, we use a very open mix, grow it quite wet. On the left is Intense, which is a great flower. Uh, Victoria in the middle, named after my sister. I believe it got an HCC. And Emerald Dove on the right. Next slide. Uh, this is the uh, geographical distribution of um, Malapuance. And Malapuance uh, is found in Vietnam and in China um, across the border in Yunnan province. Uh, next slide. This is Malapuance forma con color. It is the alba form as described by Guido Bream in 1998. Next slide <coughs> is a better view of the albiform of Malapuensi. I love the, the patterning on the foliage of Malapuensi and it comes through in the progeny as you can see in some of the seedlings. Next slide. This is Malapuensi variety Jackii uh, as described by Ruth, and Ruth Olaf Gruss and Ruth in uh, 2001. This is Tower Grove, CHM AOS 81 point. Next slide, this is the alba form <laughs> of Malapuensi variety Jackia. Next slide. And looking at Malapuensi hybrids, next slide. I love the Malapuensi hybrids. This is uh, Lindley Kupowitz, a cross of Delnadii and Malapuensi, uh, Springwater FCC AOS. And this is with a, a standard uh, Malapuensi. Next slide. This is uh, my friend Ernst Gunzenhauser in Germany flowered bees with much more intense color. And he used, according to him, he used a very intensely colored um, Malapuensi with heavy dark reticulated patterning over the petals. Um, and my question was because of the very dark vinny color uh, coloration on the inside of the lip uh, and the um, crest, um, if perhaps maybe he used a, a Del Nadii form of any color, but he says he did not. Next slide. This is Pathomoria Larry Hoyer, Malapuensi and Embersonii. This is a Keepa AMAOS. 
this particular plant produces um, viable project, viable seed. Uh, next slide. This is Vosner butterfly, uh, Malapuensi, and Vietnamese. This is Brecht's beauty, HCC AOS. It's a really nice one. Next slide. This is Greyjoy. We just um, got one of these awarded recently, this particular clone. This is Greytrix times Malapuensi. Again, taking a racopetalum and crossing it with a parvicepalum. And what I love about it is the intense patterning over the surface of the flower from the Malapuensi because the Greytrix is a white flower with a bit of coloration peppering in the, in the petals. So the saturation of color is from combining the two, which is really interesting. You never know what you're going to get when the uh, reassortment occurs. Next, uh, next slide. This is a case of taking uh, parvicepalum and crossing it with Armeniaca, I'm sorry, Malapuensi. Um, this is Unidaki. Next slide. This is Martian Man, registered in 2008 by Ken Uzuki. It's Emerald Sea and Malapuensi. Again, a complex green with Malapuensi. And then you take Martian Man one more generation, next slide, and you get uh, Martian Emperor, which is Pacific Shamrock and uh, Martian Man. This is Green Monster, Silver Metal, Japan Orchid Growers Association. The flowers on these intersectional hybrids are quite large. They're larger than the geometric average. So they're much larger than what you would expect from uh, this type of breeding. The next slide, this is Harold Kupowitz, uh, cross of Malapuensi and Rothschildianum. I love this. Um, this is Piping Rocks Jumbo AMAOS 87 uh, points. We have lots and lots of compots of a remake of this cross, and they're just about to go into two and a quarter inch pots. They're nice, big, hefty seedlings. So next slide. This is Path Emersonii as described by Coop and um, Philip Cribb in 1986. This is a particularly fine form of the species. And next slide, this is, Emer this is a geographical distribution of the species, uh, Northern Vietnam and Southern China. Next slide, this is Emersonii forma album as described by Bruce and Petchfium in 2002. Next slide, uh, looking at Emersonii hybrid. Next slide. This is one of my favorites. This is Path Lola bird, uh, cross of Emersonii and Macranthum. This is Mia, HCC AOS 79 points. Next slide. This is Franz Glanz, uh, cross of Emersonii and Armeniacum. Minion HCC AOS on the left and lemon sorbet on the right. Next slide. This is sugar sweet. Uh, taking parvicepalum again and crossing it with brachopetalum, in this case, Nivium. Uh, this is spring water HCC AOS 77 points. Next slide. This is Vosner Volca. Uh, Emersonii and Hangianum. And Hangianum just increases the size of the flower. Um, Hangianum also has a wonderful fragrance, um, which is evident when you, you know, breathe in its perfume and it is quite nice, very sweet scent. Um, next slide. This is Pat Vietnamese, uh, as described by Olaf Bruce and Perner. This is the most um, endangered of the, par of the parvicephalons because it comes from a restricted geographical distribution. Um, and it is found just in Vietnam. On the left is international, on the right is Cadence's Mojo. I'm not including all the AMs, HCCs, AOS, and all that other stuff because I want to keep it moving. Next slide. Uh, and here is the geographical distribution in Vietnam. Only, I think it's 200 uh, square miles uh, is the only, um, it's a very restricted distribution. Uh, above the uh, Salween River. Next slide. This is a uh, Vietnamese forma album. Um, next slide. Looking at Vietnamese hybrids. Next slide. This is perhaps my favorite. This is Ho Chi Minh, 
uh, Delnadii and Vietnamese. On the left is uh, Tsinghua Bronze Medal, Taiwan Kaffee Puddlum Society. And on the right is a uh, APACA CCM AOS 82 points. Next slide. This is Green Eyes, uh, one that we flowered um, a number of years ago. Um, I now have three big pots of it. So I haven't uh, done anything with it, but thinking about using it for breeding because it has really good, very large petals. Next slide. This is Vosner Vietnam Love, Macranthum and Vietnamese. This is Bear Six from, um, um, I'm forgetting the nursery, uh, Hangshan orchids, excuse me, in Taiwan. Next slide. This is Vosner Vietnam Gold, Armeniacum and Vietnamese. Love the saturation of the yellow color. I'm surprised with Vietnamese that this happened. Next. Slide, this is Bosner Vietnam Star. It's a cross of Rothschildianum and Vietnamese. This is Wan Chow, silver medal, Taiwan Orchid Growers Association, 82 points. Next slide. And this is Hangianum, as described by Perner and Bruce in 1998. Uh, next slide. This is the geographical distribution, um, Northern mm -hmm. Vietnam and Yunnan Province, China. Next slide. And this is hanging on a hill's view. This was just awarded last month. This is a seedling that uh, we flowered. Next slide. And by the way, I put the pollen on a lot of things, including complex. So hopefully those will take, and it looks like they are taking. Um, this is hanging on forma alba, uh, as described by Bruce, Bruce and Petulum um, in 2002. Really nice form on this alba. Next slide. Looking at Hangianum hybrids. Next slide. This is Shunfa Golden, a cross of Hangianum and Malapuensi. And the Shunfa Goldens have the fragrance of Malapuensi. That sweet fragrance comes through very nicely. Next slide. This is Liberty Taiwan, Hangianum and Macranthum. On the left is Bear 8, and on the right is Harju, Silver Metal, Taiwan Paphiopetalum Society, 80 points. Interesting, the, the difference in coloration. Yes. Is, I'm seeing some red coloration. I don't normally think of red color pigments in the packs from the US exclusive to the frags. Is, is the red <laughs> that in the photo, like the last slide, is that actually in the flower or is that something in the, in, or is that just how the, are, Are you asking me if it's trick photography? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll no, no, the picture because no, it is a, it's a, it's no, I have I have seen many uh, com many uh, complex paths that are red as well. As, in fact, we're working on lines of deep dark red um, complex, and I have seen some Parvis hybrids that exhibit. I wouldn't say dark red color, but next slide, you will notice you get this intense, almost a, a coral pink, almost a coloration um, to the surface of the flower. It's tough to describe flower because flower color, because we all see it a little bit differently, but it is intense. Um, but no, I've not seen any dark solid red uh, parvicephalum um, hybrids. No, but I'm sure they're working on it. Next slide. This is Anony Fuchs, Hangianum and Vietnamese. Soybean milk, I don't know why. Next slide. <laughs> this is Hung Sheng Silver. It is Hangianum and Armini White, and this has fragrance. Um, Bear three. Next slide. This is Alexei, Hangianum and Rothschildianum. And I believe in the next slide, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention two Parvicephalum natural hybrids that occur in nature. In the left is Path X fanaticum, Achasis AM AOS, uh, Macranthum, and Malapuensi. And on the right, Path X glonzii, which is, which is uh, Emersonii and Macranthum. Next slide. And here you see how we grow uh, many of the, the parvi. These are two different parvi species. I believe the left is, uh, yeah, I think they're both macranthums. We grow them in these big colonies, 
and we let them get large and, and get multiple flowers. Next slide. And here you'll see an Armeniacum on the right growing in a big um, colander. These colanders are about, about that big around. Um, and some of them are ready to go into square 17 by 17 flats. Yes. What kind of bark? Um, this particular bark here is a mixture of um, not orchiata, rexius bark mixed with turfus, uh, large turfus, pumice, and um, perlite. I believe number four perlite. Um, so it's a very open mix, but we tend to grow them cool and wet during the summer. Remember that where they come from, they tend to grow dry in the fall with heavy fog and mist. But the rains don't start until spring, late spring and summer, and then it's virtually monsoonal. So um, if you want to get them your parvi spiking, it's best to run them a little bit dry, uh, I would say for four weeks. And when I say dry, I don't mean bone dry. I mean, just hold back the water, make sure that the, that the mix is a little bit moist. You just don't want to put a ton of water on them as they're trying to, as they make up their buds. Once the buds come, and they're on their way, and you know that you can see them coming up through the growth, then you can increase the water slowly. Um, uh, Armeniacum for us tends to bloom in March. Malapuensi a little bit later than that. They tend to be, because the, I mean, Malapuensi, you know, to grow a 36 inch um, spike takes a while. They're very slow. Um, and once the buds are up there, they're even slower to open. So we're very careful not to wet the buds because you don't want to blast them. Um, so we don't run overhead watering in that section of the greenhouse when the buds are coming. Um, and I really panic when somebody else is watering. So I'm a real control freak about that. Um, next slide. Here you see um, some of the shallow pans, um, ball pans, as well as some of the five inch pots, seven inch pots even. But we try to get the Michelle, we try not to go any deeper than that um, because they send the stolons out and you want them to come up. And um, many of these larger plants here are ready to go into the, their first colanders. And, um, and I tend to repot year round. Um, the only time that I don't uh, repot is in non peak growth periods, which would be the dead of winter and the high heat of summer when it's gonna be 100 degrees, you really don't want to be recording plants. You want to hydrate them and keep them going. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's the end of the talk. Here's a group of seedlings that were flowering. Uh, I think this was taken in, I wanna say March. Yeah, March, end of March, maybe first of April. So, but they're lovely flowers. Um, and they're well worth um, the effort of growing them. Um, and if there are any questions, um, either of the audience or anyone online, yes? Um, has um, anyone done any seeding with the balance plant to be tied down? Well, actually, um, I have, we bred, I showed a a slide of Malapuensi with a bracky that we did. Straight Malapuensi to get a shorter stem. Um, I have some Malapuensis that have a little bit of a shorter stem, but they're not good flowers. So I wouldn't use them for breeding just because of that. Whenever I breed plants, I look for at least four strong criteria. At least, and if there's not four, there should at least be three. And if there's only two, if you're only going for color or something, that's one thing. But I like to see great color, great form. Um, the plant should be vigorous. Um, you know, I look for a number of criteria before I, you know, select something to be used for breeding. Um, but I understand what you're talking about, wanting to bring it down to more manageable size, but, I love the, the tall stems. Um, 
they're stately, magnificent, and that yes, they do require staking because you get a big 36 inch um, spike with a big flower on it. And you know, you, you really need to stake that or it's gonna snap uh, the growth off. But you know, that's, that's a, that is a perfect avenue for the <clears throat> hobbyist to breed. I, I think that's great. Or even the pot plant industry. You know, if you wanna produce Malapuenses for the pot plant industry, why not? I think it's a great idea, but it's not an avenue that we're pursuing. Any other questions? Yes? Um, so when you say repot throughout the year, do you subscribe to the repot yearly? Because some growers or vendors say every year you should do um, it, plant. It, it depends on what mix you're using. If you're using uh, Orchiata mix, which supposedly has a long period of, of viability and doesn't break down as quickly as some of the other barks do, um, then sure, um, you can probably go two, maybe even three years, I'm sure. Um, but I like to get in and look at the roots and the plant. Um, I will say this, because we're commercial, and when you're planting out, I don't know, a bench of 20,000 seedlings in three and a quarter inch pots, those are all going to be sold or going into the dumpster. Be and seriously, because the best thing I ever did was bring my husband into the business for the simple reason that my husband comes from uh, a nursery, a tree nursery, and they had five farms and they grew gazillions of trees. And if it wasn't a number one or a number two tree, it went in the burn pile. So, uh, and that's how they kept the quality up. And when I, I only have 8,000 square feet of, of greenhouse space, I know that sounds greedy and big, but it really isn't. It's a small nursery. Um, we have two uh, greenhouses, 135 feet long by, I don't know, 36 feet wide. Um, if I don't clear a bench uh, in a season, um, what am I going to do with all the stuff coming along in compot two and a quarter, not to mention the stuff coming out of the lab, because I just can't keep my fingers to myself. I have to be out there making crosses and seeing what's new and, and producing more and more seedlings each year. Um, although we're kind of to the point where we both like to retire, we sold our Miltonia collection to a Hawaiian grower um, and our path collection is up for sale. So if anybody's interested, talk to me after. Um, because we really want to retire. I mean, I, my husband's 80, I'm 72. Um, and while I love doing this, um, I'd like to get out while there's still time to travel and spend time, you know. Are you mentoring someone for your quarters? Um, I have to say I'm really not. Um, mainly because um, there just isn't anybody around to mentor. We're, we're kind of, we're in the valley. We're about 35, 40 miles outside of Portland, southeast from Portland in the Willamette Valley. Um, so wine and orchids. So what? Wine and orchids. Wine and orchids. The Willamette Valley to the wine and orchids. <laughs> but I plan on growing orchids in retirement. I plan on uh, going back and 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 picking up a few, maybe do some Miltonia breeding, maybe some grow a few Draculas and Mazda values just for my own enjoyment because I love them so much, um, and a few Parvies. Um, but um, who knows? Any other any questions from anybody um, online? Ah, okay. Uh, let's see. I don't see. Oh. What's the most expensive? What's the most expensive or the most cherished? Um, well, um, ooh, I would say the most expensive plant we ever sold was for fourteen thousand dollars, and it was a gold medal. It was the first gold medal on um, a, oh gosh, not gigantifolium, but um, the other Colapakingii that Marie Riappel got a gold medal uh, from in Portland. And she sold me a division and that plant went to an a, uh, orchid judge that judges the World Orchid Conference in Noumea, New Caledonia. So we sent it bare root through Australia. It took a month to get there. 
and it got there in perfect condition. He was thrilled, and so was I, because it was irreplaceable. So that was the most expensive plant we ever sold. Um, uh, 14,000, that was the most we ever sold, but that isn't my biggest single sale, no. So, but want to buy the nursery? <laughs> yeah. It's a little more than that, but just a little. I have a question. You mentioned the wrapping, the carbocephalic combination and testimonials. Yeah, I love them. But I know that Tyanamins have been used in wash out colors too. So, is um, well, I was really surprised um, uh, getting so much coloration. If we could go back um, to keep going back. Keep going back. Keep going. Okay, we're getting close. Keep going back. There, right there. Right there. This particular, it's the path gray joy. Um, I was really shocked when these started to flower. I wasn't expecting this intense coloration because uh, gray tricks is an all white flower with just a little bit of peppering. And then crossing it with Malapuensi. Now Malapuensi does have this sort of patterning, but it doesn't have that patterning in the dorsal sepal. I mean, the whole thing is just flushed with color all the way. And some of the other thing, ones that we flowered have even more intense coloration, but they don't have as decent a shape as this one. Right, that's um, probably not um, well, uh, I, I'm trying to think of uh, if you. No, I, I guess my question really is, it's not just any grass. Well, all like of the. Oh, oh, I see. Well, yes. When you cross Velachulum and several of the others, like go to Freud, um, with um, things like Macrantham, um, and even when Chenin's, the um, one slide that I showed with the intense coloration, um, yes, you do get that. But the fact that this quite primary, a fairly primary hybrid of gray tricks, um, with Malapuensi in one generation produced this, I'm really, I was really surprised. I was not expecting it. So, yes. So, talking, depending on the genera, you know, Bob and Bob will tell you that for Odox, the pod are, are tall and charismatic a lot, but the max values they don't as much. The, um, but no, with the say that. what's the with these types with the Harvey's breeding and the other, have you seen difference in using them as pod or pod of character um, um, for reciprocal process? As a rule of thumb, I remember Terry Root saying, you want to take the larger flower and put it on the smaller brachy when you're doing that kind of breeding, the, the larger complex onto the brachy. Um, I also remember a lecture that um, was given at the World Orchid Conference in Canada. Uh, and I'm trying to think of whose work that was. It was, it was on breeding yellow uh, Phalaenopsis. And it was Dr. Griesbach who stated that when you're breeding uh, for intense yellow coloration. So that's because of the plasmids. It's because it's because the mitochondrial is female. Yeah, the mitochondrial. Exactly because of yeah, that's where a lot of the intense yellow coloration comes from. So you want to use the yellow uh, as the, as the, the female the parent. But the other, but, but non yellows, it doesn't add as much. If Bob was saying with the with the yep. dogs, I'm just trying to right. think. Well, there are, there are there are exceptions. There are surprises. You know, when you're taking two different <clears throat> groups of genes and they're resorting, you have no idea. It's a, it's a gamble. So, I mean, even within our families, I mean, my sister Victoria, um, she looks more like my mother's German. I look like my dad, who is Portuguese and Mexican to get into, you know, that whole uh, thing. My brother Robert is uh, real short like my mother and I'm tall like my dad. 
and have his coloration. So our family is really interesting. And then of course we have a Japanese on one side of the family um, and um, my uncle Robert um, looks more Asian than uh, Hispanic. So um, we're, our whole family is, I mean, we have um, you know, the Ragazzi side of the family, they're Swiss German. And, and so I'm a real American. We have just about everything in our, in our family. So, but it, there's always those interesting uh, flowers, even within a group of seedlings flowering for the first time, there will be, as an example, we did a, a remake of Ma Bell, which I brought some seedlings. And I used, that was used uh, with a Balachula Malba. And I stated when I released them that we don't expect any Albas out of this uh, pairing between Malapuensi and Balachula Malba. Well, there are two Alba on the bench that haven't flowered yet. They have all of the characteristics, green underside of the leaves instead of red. The leaves look like a typical Alba. Those two seedlings are not for sale. I want to see them flower because if they are albas, I would love to sieve them and make more. So that was a real complete surprise because you would not expect in the first generation for there to be albas. Well, and, and we don't really know what, you know, it isn't just a, it isn't just a pair of alleles that switches on albas. There is more going on. So. Do you want to talk about what's on the table for the- Oh yeah, yeah, the seedlings that- Oh, okay, well, I brought um, just a mixture um, of different plants. Um, there's a uh, Lindley Kupowitz um, in the group, which is one of the slides that I showed. And I also brought uh, uh, three, I think, three complex hybrids. Half Osage Eagle is a spotted red, uh, half. Um, uh, Chinook Eagle is also a spotted red. Now, this is Matchmaker. It's a red. It's all a red. Uh, and then I brought two, um, uh, two Mariac types. This is captivating, but you are captivating me. And some of these are really dark. This has really good dark coloration at the base of the foliage. These are really nice, uh, wide, segmented Mariac types. This is macabre rapture. I love these. I flowered several of them and kept them uh, aside from breeding. It's a cross of macabre uh, Christine, which has an AM, very white petaled one. In fact, there's one when I was uh, packing plants, I found to see that the petals are so wide. Uh, it's from the macabre uh, parent. And it's crossed with Hatchelow's um, contrast that have solid white petals. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also brought a gold dollar. This is Armeniacum uh, crossed with Primulinum um, album. And there's a photo of them uh, on the sale bench. And I brought uh, Rafi hybrids and a couple of species, uh, half lowy eyes, um, and just a group of complex. So thank you. Raffle tickets on sale. If you didn't go there, if people knew want to get access to this, there's a nice thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
This is fair mod. Fair mod, okay. That's a good one. And the other one that and the other one that I brought is Maurice Coat, I think. Yes. Yeah. So nice fairy and type and a nice um, complex. And then and then Tom Barrett brought in a, a very nice collection of Harvestephalum, um, Urbanianum, and other type of uh, pack Yeah, here's an adorable little With multiple flowers as well, and then of course, a very nice tongue. A nice carbocephalum type, similar to what we saw tonight for our speaker. Oh, here's the nice dark one. This is really warm. A really warm. Yes, it certainly is. It's really dark. And talking about yeah. things that we saw in our speaking tonight, this is Del Nadia. Mm -hmm. So, for this is a real world example of what we saw tonight in speaking. Here's Sukakulia, one of my favorites. This is yeah. un this un this un yeah. You don't see that very well. No, um, this is my Asianthera brage. You can see all of the little flowers in it. Well, people call this the one with kissing snails. <laughs> That's what it was like for some people. Um, Here's my Microcelia Celsii, which is not quite in full bloom yet, but this is one of the African leafless orchids. <coughs> oh, my. Finally, got it's blooming at the moment in the very direction. This is the most interesting. hybrid. This is a chlorothalonis form. I wanted to bring a couple chlorothalonis because they don't get much to play around here. This one gets a lot of flowers. Yeah, this is this is dendrobium. Like an like an astra because it reminded whoever named it of lichens. It's one of the uh, the tough Australian ones. Something you can, you know, can take a lot of. It's very dry climates. Okay, and I'm just going to hold this up. I've got a couple of pomegranates here. They're from Brazil. Very pretty little things, and also my Catlia forcii, also from Brazil. And that's the green form. There, it is not the alba. There is a there is an orange form and a green form. This is the green form of forcii. Okay. Um, Well, no, it's a Lelia, but Taxon is oh, smoking okay. something right now. Uh, yeah, that's not. Yeah. 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 It's a repetulous Lelia. It's, yeah. yeah. it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's only known as Pat because they've really gone into the jungles and started to describe a bunch of these yeah. repetuluses that are the more full segmented ones compared to the more starry, like Harper Phillips. And then this is a Donna Blossom. Um, I don't support stupidity, so I don't, so I don't use the concept for a Donna Blossom. I'm very yeah, This is a nice dark flower. This is where that dark white and black coloration comes from. This is the species behind that type of line of creating a photo. Tom, Marina Flores brings in this dendrobium as victim. There's a little
And this is this is uh, this is for Adam Black Comet. So this is Beringiana by um, Cochleota um, Encyclia Cochleota. Um, this is a beautiful color. It's been there and we brought in two the last couple months and keep, keep reminding me why I should buy one of these crosses. Which is also in the in the slideshow and the uh, it means yellow rosy, the gold rosy. Yeah. And Ray comes to Vignana, brought in by Jeff Harris. These nice spidery flowers. That two flowers? Yes. Three. Two. Yeah, there was two. That's not very tasty. Uh, and then the ones that is the more heavy stuff. It looks like yellow. It is. And then this is a uh, level glass, and I'm now doing the scale and you know, TCI. A cool growing Mexican species. That's my favorite. I like them a lot. Great. You need to find the flowers of this um, there. The candies. I brought that in for people to see in person for the target. Yeah. This is where we're having jewelers look. People they came all year long. If you can see the petals of the flower, you can automatically pass your uh, the DMP. You don't, don't have to take it. Uh, eye exam for DMP. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one is a little uh, it's a little bit of a direct for red bell. Another pretty little organ. There's none of it. You can find that. That's another one in the same city. city. Yeah. And that's basically a Boricana. Related to uh, Phoenicia. Uh, they call them sometimes the chocolate on cities. They smell, smell like chocolate and they have a dirt. They like to be very extremely dirty. This is gorgeous. I can't even. I've never been able to get one of these to stay alive over the winter. The dendrobium unicum. Absolutely. And the next one. And the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lelia perforata or calderai form, the cerulean form. It's perforata, and this is from Jeff Harris. And then the last plant here is also from Jeff Harris. The Jeff T. Harris is the Barcaria metabolis. And I believe this got an award tonight. Jump it. Did this get an award? Yeah. Jump it. What did this get tonight? Oh, uh, AME. Well, Good <laughs> <laughs> so for getting the point six. Thank you for getting the point six. That's everything. He was outside. He was taken off. All right. Okay. <laughs> 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 
in too late for last month. So it was blooming last month. It's a Malia Superbans very not, not, not seeing the slideshow. You're not seeing the slide. Okay. That's okay. Yes. Does that work? Yeah. yeah much better. And now just uh, you know switch to slideshow view. Is it that that's the presentation? This is not the show. And oh, we know, we know, Roberta. Thank you. Oh, you doing your own good? Good. Somebody knows how to use Okay, so I can just do it on. Yes, okay. Back, back to Tom Pickford's Lelia Superbens, um, which is a species from Mexico into Central America. It's epiphytic in oak forest. I was really happy to see this because mine bloomed at the same time with that incredibly long stalk, and I wondered whether it was supposed to do that. Um, it, is there a way we can get rid of this thing down the middle? Water. 
Yeah. I'll just go on. Here's uh, Jeff Stendrobium around Tyrosium, Rebecca Northern. Which is Arantarosium means gold pink, and it's uh, from the mountains of New Guinea, epiphytic at about 8,000 feet. That's okay. We can, that's, we can go on. All right, this, all right, that's good. Thank you. And here's the Barcaria spectabilis. Spectabilis means just what you think it does. It's another species from Mexico into Central America, growing grows on oak trees. There are almost just under 20 species of Barcaria, so not a very large genus. Here's Heidi's Cymbidium, which she doesn't have a name on. If anybody knows what, what its name is, I'm sure she'd be happy to know. Growing outside in Modesto in the shade cloth. Here's Heidi's uh, Stanhopia Reichenbachiana Eve. The Stanhopias are from uh, the Cauca area of Colombia, which seems to produce an awful lot of different orchids in the Andes there. It likes it humid and it can, it, in nature, it grows epiphytically, lithotropically, or even semi terrestrial. Here's Susan Anderson's Arangus, which is now, she had it labeled as an Anglican, but it's now an Arangus uh, fatuosa. The uh, fatuosa means magnificent, and this is one of the little Madagascar and Anglicoids. It likes it shady and warm. Here's her Macroplinium. Lesser Santa, Gold Country. Amazing amount of flowers there. It's a twig epiphyte and from humid areas in Mexico. Here's Susan's Shonarchus manipurensis, which um, now has a new name to it, now fragrance. It grows in um, Southeast Asia and sometimes on the roots of Renanthoros. Here's Dan Anderson's Baragiara Sunkiss Buttercup, which is a complex species composed of mostly oncidiums. And grows, I'm assuming, in her intermediate greenhouse. Here's Jan's Lelia Pucarima. Pucarima means very beautiful. It's one of the Brazilian species, which is probably a Catlia now. It's uh, Lobata by Pucarata. It grows cool to warm. Here's Jayan's gangara, a species. Don't really know the name of it. These always remind me of hummingbirds in flight, with the, the form of them. There are the gangara, there are 69 species of gangara uh, from the Andes. They're related to Stanopias. They generally have pendant for inflorescences, as you can see there, so they need to be grown in baskets and hung up. Here is Jan's Guarantica Tophila, Sunco's Hot Lava Star, is the name I found for this. She submitted it as the Myrmicopia Tibetinus uh, by Lelia Catlia Rojo. The Myrmicopia means ant. Um, and bearing, and they, the myrmecophias have hollow pseudobulbs that ants live in and help keep things like, like aphids off the plants. 
Here's Dave Hermeyer's Leptodes bicolor, which I'm wondering whether it's the same plant blooming again. He submitted it uh, a few months ago, actually. And if it blooms that often, that's really a good plant. Uh, Leptodes means slim, and it, which is named for the terrene shaped leaves. Another Brazilian species. Here's his Dendrobium modigeci, blooming like crazy. It's from the mountains in Southeast Asia. It can be fairly high, so it can grow cool. Dendrobium thrissiflorum. Thrissiflorum means pine cone like, and it, whoever named it thought that the shape of the inflorescence looked like a pine cone, which you can see pretty much on the, the one hanging on the right there. It's another uh, dendrobium from Southeast Asia. It can grow cool to warm. Here's Judy Zoo's Phalaenopsis surf song, the salmon splendor variety, and named for its color, as you can see. This has, this is a complex hybrid with at least seven different species in its background. It took 15 generations to get to this, but that's an amazing color. Here's her uh, Leo's berry phalaenopsis with the three different colors, which is kind of amazing. Here's Roberta's Dendrobium ringaniensis, um, which is named for the mountain on Lombok that it comes from. And Lombok is the one closest to Bali in Indonesia. So it goes outside for Roberta. Here's her. Epidendrum lacustra, the purple variety, called wild fireworks, as you can see, it's a clone of an awarded species. And her epigenium, which is now a dendrobium, Farsii. And Diplocarobium aratriferum. There are about 100 species in the genus of Diplocarobium, which are now all dendrobiums. And the, the name means two pseudobulbs because they have two different kinds of pseudobulbs on them. Um, Roberta must have really been watching this to get such good pictures because the flowers only last a day and then they're gone. Uh, here's my Andrecon pseudophilicornium. I included that middle picture because I was so weird to me the way the flower is attached to its stem. Uh, that's an, a plant I got in Madagascar, which is where its home is. <laughs> And supposedly can go cool to warm. I grow it in an intermediate greenhouse. Um, here's my Cattleya extellosa, which is a natural hybrid between the GZI and Walkeriana, two Brazilian species from Southeast Brazil. Mastabalia ignea yellow, which the, the main picture, the biggest picture there is the one that is labeled yellow, which is to me, it's very clearly quite orange. I included the picture on the right to show you what the regular ignea is, uh, is like the red form. And here's Platystelli umbellata, which is for those of you who think you don't have any room for orchids, you can grow, you can have this one. It's a three inch plant uh, with these raspberry like umbels of flowers. 
Deanna Patty Bell shows us her Bobophila macalensa, which is named for the mountain in Luzon in the Philippines that it comes from. It grows warm to hot and probably very humid. So I wanted, I didn't say that, but the order in which these slides were shown is the order in which we received them. And nobody submitted anything for pet parade and teachers didn't feel like posing. So that's our, that's our virtual show and tell. Bitch, are we the record? I'm sure are we turning it off and doing the raffle? I believe we are, yes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody online. Thank you, everybody for online. See you uh, everyone will be Zoom on month, but but please do join us on Zoom. We will we can you can watch the orchid see pretty things while watching fireworks. And we're still doing the show and tell by Zoom. Are we? I'm not going to be channel. Okay. Um, TBA on show and tell. TBA. We'll submit them anyway. Submit them anyways. We'll either do it or we'll see. So, what? Uh, uh, we pick one from the basket. Yeah, we do. Oh, as soon as we get them, we can send them. The, the show and tell basket. And we're still doing orders for bar order to be placed tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. 